Uh, I thought it'd be great to talk to you, given where you sit in the world, as AI is on the brink of and is actively changing the world. Obviously, um, you know, you founded Google with Larry in 1998, and um, you know, recently it's been reported that you've kind of spent a lot more time at Google working on AI. I thought maybe, and, and a lot of industry analysts and pundits have been kind of arguing that LLMs and conversational AI tools are kind of an existential threat to Google search. That's, that's one of the, and I think a lot of those people don't build businesses or they have competitive investments, but you know, we'll leave that to the side. Um, but there's this big kind of narrative on what's gonna happen to Google and, and where's Google sitting with AI. So, and I know you're spending a lot of time on it, so thanks for coming to talk about it. How much time are you spending at Google? What are you working on? Yeah, um, honestly, like pretty much every day. I mean, like I'm missing today, which yeah. is, you know, one of the one of the reasons I was a little reluctant. But I'm glad I came. Um, <laughs> but I think as a computer scientist, I've never seen anything as exciting as uh, all of the AI progress that's happened the last few years. Thanks. <laughs> um, no, but it's, it's kind of mind-blowing. When I went to grad school in the 90s, you know, AI was like kind of like a footnote in the curriculum almost. Like, you like, oh, maybe you have to do this one little test on AI. We tried all these different things. They don't really work. That's it. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Um, and then somehow, miraculously, all these people who were working on neural nets, which was one of the big discarded uh, approaches to AI in like the 60s, 70s, and so forth, um, just started to make progress. A little bit more compute, a little more, more data, a few clever algorithms. Um, and the thing that's happened in this last decade or so is just amazing as a computer scientist. Like every month, um, you know, well, all of you, I'm sure, use all of the AI tools out there. But like every month, there's like a new amazing capability, and I'm like probably you know doubly wow does everybody else's yeah. that computers can do this. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I really got back into the technical work um, because I just don't want to miss out on this um, as a computer scientist. Is it an extension of search or a rewriting of how people? retrieve information? I mean, I just think that the AI touches so many different elements of day-to-day -day life, and sure, search is one of them, uh, but it kind of covers everything. Um, for example, programming itself, right. like the way that I think right. about it is very different now. Like, you know, writing code from scratch feels really hard compared to just asking the AI to do it. Right. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so what do you do then? <laughs> um, actually, I've written a little bit of code myself yeah. just, for, uh, just for kicks, just for fun. Uh, and then sometimes I've had the AI write the code for me, um, uh, which, was, which was fun. Um, I mean, just one example. I wanted to see how good our AI models were at Sudoku. <laughs> So I had the AI model itself write a bunch of code that would automatically generate Sudoku puzzles and then feed them to the AI itself and then score it and so forth. Right. Um, but it could just write that code and I was like talking to the engineers about it and you know, whatever, we had some debate back and forth. Like I came back half an hour later, it's done. And they, they were kind of impressed because they don't honestly use the AI tools for their own coding as much as I think they ought to. Right. Um. So that's an interesting example because maybe there's a model that does Sudoku really well. Maybe there's a model that like answers information questions for me about facts in the, in the world. Maybe there's an AI model that designs houses. Um, a lot of people are working towards these ginormous general purpose LLMs. Is that where the world goes? Some people I think refer, I don't know who wrote this recently, said there's a God model, like there's gonna be a God model and that's why everyone's investing so much is if you can build the God model, you're done. You've got your AGI or whatever terms you wanna use. There's this one thing to rule them all. Or is the reality of AI that there are lots of smaller models that do application specific things, maybe work together like in an agent system. Like what's the, what, what, what is the evolution of model development and, and, the, the, and how models are ultimately used to do all these cool things. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like if you looked 10, 15 years ago, there were 
different AI techniques that were used for different problems altogether. Like, uh, you know, the chess playing AI was very different than image generation, which was, you know, very different. Um, than, so like recently the graph neural net at Google that like outperformed every physics forecasting model. I don't know if you know this, but I you guys sure published it, so it's pretty I'm awesome. I'm kind of embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, but it was like a totally different architect. It was a different system. It was trained differently, and it ended up yeah, in that uh, particular. So there, historically, there have been different systems, yeah. and even recently, um, like the International Math Olympiad that we yeah. uh, participate in, we got um, silver medal as an AI, actually one point away from gold. Um, but we actually had three different AI models in there. Mm. There was one very uh, formal theorem proving model that actually did basically the best. There was one uh, specific to geometry problems, mm. believe it or not, that was just a special kind of AI. Uh, and then there was a general purpose language model. Um, but uh, since then, we've tried to take the learnings from that. That was just a couple months ago. Uh, and uh, try to infuse some of the sort of knowledge and ability from the formal prover into our general language models. Um, that's still a work in progress. But I do think the trend is to have a more unified model. I don't know if I'd call it a god model, uh, but to have certainly sort of shared architectures and ultimately even shared models. Um, right. So if that's true, you need a lot of compute to train and develop that model, that big model. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you definitely need a lot of compute. I, I think, like, I've, I've read some articles out there that just, like, extrapolate. They're like, you know, it's like 100 megawatts and a gigawatt and then 10 gigawatts and 100 gigawatts. And I don't know if I'm quite a believer in, you know, that level of extrapolation. Um, partly because also the algorithmic improvements that have come over the course of the last few years uh, maybe are actually even outpacing the increased compute that's put into these models. So is it irrational, the build-out that's happening, everyone talking about the NVIDIA revenue, the NVIDIA profit, the NVIDIA market cap, supporting all of what people call the hyperscalers and the growth of the infrastructure needed to build these very large-scale models using the techniques of today. Is this irrational or is it rational because if it works it's so big that it doesn't um, matter how much you Well, spend. first of all, I'm not like an economist or like a market watcher the way that you guys are very carefully um, watch companies, so I just want to disclaim my abilities in the space. Um, I think that I know uh, for us, we're kind of building out compute as quickly as we can and we just have a huge amount of demand. I mean, for example, our cloud customers just want a huge amount of TPUs, GPUs, you name it. Um, you know, we just can't, we have to turn down customers uh, because we just don't have the compute available. Uh, and we use it internally to train our own models, to serve our own models, and so forth. So I guess I think there are very good reasons that companies are currently building out compute at a fast pace. Um, I just don't know that I would look at the training trends and extrapolate three orders of magnitude ahead just blindly from where we are today. But the enterprise demand is there, out there. You know, I mean, they, they want to do lots of other things, for example, running inference on all yeah. these AI models, applying them to all these um, new applications. Um, yeah, there doesn't seem to be uh, a limit right now. And where have you seen the greatest success, surprising success, in the application of models, whether it's in robotics or biology? What are you like seeing that you're like, wow, this is really working? And where are things going to be more challenging and take longer than I think some people might be expecting? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, now that you mentioned those, well, I would say in biology, you know, we've had AlphaFold for quite a while, um, and uh, I'm not personally a biologist, but when I talk to biologists out there, like everybody uses it, and it's more recent uh, variants. Um, and that is, I guess, a different kind of AI. But like I said, I do think all these things tend to converge. Um, you know, robotics, for the most part, I see in this sort of wow stage, like, wow, you could make a robot do that with just, you know, 
this general purpose language model or just a little bit of fine tuning this way or that and it's like amazing uh, but maybe not for the most part yet at the level of robustness that would make it like day to day useful. But you um, see a line of sight to it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be. It's. A, I don't see any particular. But Google obstacles. had the robotics business and then spun it out or sold it. We've had like. You had a lot of five or six yeah. robotics businesses. They just weren't. That, the timing wasn't right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know. I guess. Yeah. I, I think that was just a little too early, to be perfectly honest. I mean, there was like Boston Dynamics. Um, was called um, Start Stamp. I don't even remember all the ones. We had, anyway, we've had like five or six, embarrassingly. Yeah. Um, but they're very cool. Um, and they're very impressive. Um, it, yeah, it just feels kind of silly having done all of that work uh, and seeing now how capable these general language models are that include, for example, vision and image and they're yep. multimodal and they can understand the scene and everything and not having had that at the time, uh, yeah, it just feels like you were sort of on a treadmill that wasn't going to get anywhere without the modern AI technology. You spend a lot of time on core technology. Do you also spend a lot of time on product visioning, where are things going, and what like the human computer interaction modality they're going to be in the future in a world of AI everywhere? Like, um, I, what's our life going to be like? I mean, I guess there's water cooler chit chat about right. things like that. Um, Care to share any? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> um, trying to think of things that aren't embarrassing. Um, <laughs> struggling, but uh, We're all friends. I, I guess it's like just really hard to, you know, just forecast, like you know, to think five years out because, you know, based on the base technical capability of the AI is what enables the applications. Um, and then sometimes, you know, somebody will just whip up a little demo that you just didn't think about. Um, and it'll be kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and of course, then from demo to actually making it, it real and production and so forth takes time. Um, I don't know if you've played with like uh, the Astra model, but it's just sort of live video and audio, and you can chat with the AI about what's going on in your environment. You'll give and, me access, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll get, well, once I have access. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sort of uh, sometimes the slowest to get some of these things. Um, but it's. Um, uh, and uh, you're like, oh my god, this is amazing. And then you're like, okay, well, it does it correctly like 90% of the time, but am I really like, is that then worth it? If 10% of the time it's kind of making a mistake or taking too long or whatever. And then you have to work, 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 work to get to perfect all those things, make it responsive, make it available, whatever. Right. And then you actually end up with something kind of amazing. I heard a story that you went in, you were on site. I should have mentioned this to you before you came on stage to see if you were cool about talking about it, but <laughs> okay. here we are. Um, and there like a bunch of engineers showed you that you could like use AI to write code. And it was like, well, we haven't pushed it in Gemini yet um, because we want to make sure it doesn't make mistakes. And there was this like hesitation culturally at Google to do that. And you were like, no, if it writes code, push it. And you really, and a lot of people have told me this story because they said, and, um, or you know, I've heard this, that it was really important to hear that from you, the founder, in being really clear that Google's conservatism, you know, can't rule the day today, and we need to kind of see Google push the envelope. Is that accurate? Is that kind of huh. how you've spent some time? Or I don't remember the specific incident, yeah. just to be honest. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm not surprised. Um, I mean, I guess that's the question for me, is like, as Google's gotten so big, there's more to lose. I think there's like this, um, yeah, I think there's a little bit of fearful, I mean, language models to begin with, like we invented them basically right. with a transformer paper that was, um, whatever, six, eight years ago, something yeah. like that. Um, and, uh, oh, no one, by the way, is back at Google now, which is awesome. Oh, um, and um, yeah, we were, we were too timid uh, to deploy them. Um, 
And, you know, for a lot of good reasons, like whatever, they some make mistakes, they say embarrassing things, whatever, you know. Um, they're, you know, sometimes they're just like kind of embarrassing how dumb they are. Even today's like real latest and greatest things like make yeah. really stupid mistakes yeah. people would never make. Um, and at the same time, like they're incredibly powerful and they can help you do things you never would have done. And, um, you know, like I've like programmed pretty, really complicated things with my kids. Like they'll just program it because they just ask the AI using all these really complicated APIs and all kinds of things that would take like a month to like learn. So I just think that that capability is magic and uh, you need to be willing to have some embarrassments uh, and take uh, some risks. And, um, and I think we've gotten better at that. And well, you guys have probably seen some more embarrassments. Uh, um, but you're comfortable but with that. I mean, you have super voting stock. You're still like, I mean, you're comfortable with the embarrassments at this stage because it's so important to do this? Like, I mean, not, not particular on the basis of my stock. Right. But, I, I, um, but as a, you know, I mean, but I, am I comfortable? Your principles, um, yeah. I mean, I guess I just think of it as this something magical we're giving the world. Yeah. And I think as long as we communicate it properly, yeah. like saying like, look, this thing is amazing and we'll periodically get stuff really wrong, yeah. uh, then I think we should put it out there and let people experiment and see what new ways they find to use it. Um, I just don't think this is the technology you want to just kind of keep close to the chest and hidden until it's like perfect. Mm. Do you think that there's so many places that AI can affect the world and so much value to be created that it's not really a race between Google and Meta and Amazon? Like people frame these things as kind of a race. Is there just so much value to be created that you're working on a lot of different opportunities and it's not really about who builds the, the model that score, the LLM that scores the best, that there's so much more to it? I mean, how do you kind of think about um, the world out there and Google's place in it? I mean, I, I think it's very helpful to have competition in the sense that all these guys are vying, and um, we were just we were number one for on Alemsis for a couple of weeks, by the way, uh, just now. And I think we're last time I checked, we're still beat the top model. There's just some okay, so Elo you, so, stuff. So you do care, yeah? yeah. <laughs> not saying, not, not back, but um, yeah, yeah. No, uh, and uh, um, and I, you know, we've come a long way since um, you know a couple whatever years ago when um, ChatGPT launched, or and we were quite a ways behind. Uh, I'm really pleased with all the progress we made. So we definitely pay attention. I mean, I think it's great that there are all these AI companies out there, be it uh, us, uh, OpenAI, Anthropic, um, you yeah. name it. There's uh, Mistral. It's it's a I mean, it's a big, fast-moving field. But I guess your question is, yeah, I mean, I think there's tremendous value uh, to humanity. And I, I think if you think back, uh, you know, like when uh, I was in college, let's say, and there wasn't really a proper internet or like web the way that we know it today, like the amount of effort it would take to get basic information, huh. the amount of effort it would take to communicate with people, yeah. you know, before cell phones and things. Um, like we've gained so much capability uh, across the world. Uh, but the sort of the new AI is another big capability. Uh, and pretty much everybody in the world can get access to it in one form or another these days. And I think it's super exciting. It's awesome.